Hi, Quick Take. Today we are breaking down the many symptoms of COVID-19. I'm Krumi Mori in Tokyo and welcome to our live q and I'm joined today by Jason Gale, our Bloomberg News Health Editor based in Melbourne. So Jason, thanks for coming on. Hey, Rumi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Not bad. <laughs> I'm busy. Okay. Yeah, so today, symptoms, right? I think many of us are wondering what we can expect, what we should be looking out for. When we first heard about COVID-19, pneumonia was the big, big worry to start out with. But now we keep hearing about other symptoms. And COVID toe, by the way, by the way, is a big one that we've all been hearing about. And that's been a super hot topic. What is that all about? Yeah, so we've um, as we've now got four million cases at least around the world. We're seeing all kinds of different um, manifestations of COVID. Uh, we heard about things like diarrhea and gastrointestinal upsets. Then it was um, loss of smell and taste, and now we're hearing about this COVID toe. So what we're talking about here, and you can see some photographs, are these. Um, blistering, chill blame like lesions, oh. purple, red. They're coming up on the toes. Sometimes they're on the fingers, sometimes other parts of the foot. Um, and these are caused by tiny blood vessel clots um, just beneath the skin. Um, fortunately, they're pretty benign, um, but they nevertheless are uh, symbolic of um, someone having um, the COVID-19 infection. So something else we've heard in the past couple of weeks is that COVID can also cause strokes, especially in younger people. So is that related to COVID toe and other blood clots? Yes, indeed. So that's on the other spectrum of the severity scale, um, other end of the uh, spectrum. Uh, so strokes have been appearing in younger people. Uh, New York City, Boston um, have reported cases um, and in fact, it's the, the symptom that brings people to hospital in some cases. It's still fairly rare overall. I mean, some of these cities have had tens of thousands of cases. So the, um, the presentation of, of stroke is, is fairly unusual. But in these younger people, uh, younger than 50, um, it is really pretty striking. And so um, patients have ended up needing to have their clot removed. Um, uh, because it's lodged in a large vessel of their brain, um, threatening sort of major neurolo neurological damage. Um, and that has been a, a feature too of, uh, of COVID-19, a, a rare one though. So talk us through it for a lot of us who aren't medical experts. What is causing the blood to clot in the first place? Yeah, so a few um, viruses uh, and infections can cause um, the blood to coagulate and clot. Um, it's uh, part of the immune response to infection. Um, we're seeing that happen quite a lot with COVID-19, the blood um, getting, uh, the blood vessels actually getting damaged, particularly at that intersection of where um, the, the blood is oxygenated through alveoli, the other grape-like sacs, air sacs in the, in the lung, and they're surrounded by these capillaries. Um, and when the virus is attacking the alveoli, it's causing some disruption to the blood lining of these uh, capillaries. Uh, and that's starting off a, a cascade of clotting. And so little clumps of um, platelets um, can end up um, moving around in the bloodstream and then can sort of lodge in, in peripheral places like the fingers and the toes. Um, uh, but then these little clots can sort of snowball into bigger clots uh, and then they can move around the bloodstream from like the, um, you might have heard of deep vein thrombosis. That's um, something that uh, can occur when you're on a plane and, and uh, sitting down for 12 hours. Um, but we're seeing um, these clots can occur uh, in the deep veins of the legs and move to the lungs and cause what's called a pulmonary embolism. And so that's been a, quite a, a big problem in severely sick COVID-19 patients in Europe, um, uh, pulmonary embolism. So it sounds like there are many, uh, many issues associated with the blood clots, of course, but is there anything uh, doctors can do for it for, for COVID-19 uh, yeah. patients? Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, doctors have now become a lot more alert, especially to this um, pulmonary embolism problem, because that's uh, a clot that's in the lung that um, can move across into the arteries that supply the heart. 
And when that happens, it can um, really cause a big backup of blood and put, put a lot of pressure on the heart leading to cardiac failure. Um, so doctors are now um, using a, a blood test called the D-dimer blood test to look for um, patients who might have um, clots um, forming in their bloodstream. And then they can use anticoagulant medicines like heparin to try to um, reduce the formation of these clots. And they can also use clot busting drugs to try to dissolve the clots. Um, so the good thing is that uh, as doctors have become a lot um, more aware of this clotting problem, they're able to use um, preventative treatments um, and therapeutics to actually address the problem. Um, because we've seen uh, clots are forming um, in the bloodstream uh, and, and really cutting off blood supply to organs throughout the body. I, we've mentioned the lungs and the brain and the toes, but we've also seen the same phenomenon affecting the liver and the kidneys and the bowel, and they've found uh, clots in the prostate. And they've actually also seen, which is quite worrying in pregnant women, um, clots can, can form in the placenta and that can actually um, reduce blood supply to the fetus. And that has been um, uh, associated with um, miscarriage and um, a reduction in birth weight um, for the fetus. So that's a concern as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's terrible. Um, I know uh, some people have been saying, talking about these symptoms could kind of be just trying to scare them. Um, can we talk a little bit about why maybe learning about the symptoms and trying to understand a little bit more about COVID-19 symptoms can be important and can be informative for, for the average Joe, for everybody? out there in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I think all of these um, unusual presentations, atypical presentations, if you like, can kind of inform um, patients and doctors about what to do, what to, to do if they see someone who's suddenly lost their sense of smell and taste. Well, that could be a sign of um, the coronavirus infection and they should get tested. And if they're positive, then they need to self-isolate so they can stop uh, spreading it to other people. Same with COVID toes. Now that we know that these odd um, lesions around the feet and sometimes the fingers can be a sign of, of the blood clotting problem that's associated with the disease. Again, that may lead to people recognizing that they may have the coronavirus infection and to um, self-isolating. And um, Or if they do start to get other symptoms, uh, seek uh, care for it uh, at, in the hospital or by a healthcare provider. So all of these things are sort of informing a better response to the infection and, and ideally to prevent it from spreading to other people. Great, yeah. Um, so before I ask you this next question, um, everybody who's watching in the audience, this is a live Q&A. If you have a question for Jason, please write it in the comment section and I'll be sure to ask Jason, okay? Um, all right, Jason, the other thing I want to ask you is looking ahead, what are the long-term effects and how serious could they be of COVID-19? Yeah, so we've heard about people who have um, uh, reported like a reactivation of the infection. They have been sick with um, COVID-19 and then they've felt better uh, and feel like they've recovered only to then days later suddenly feel ill again, um, shortness of breath, things like that. Now, doctors are concerned that that might actually be because of blood clots that have formed in the lung. Um, and that what might be causing their shortness of breath is the fact that blood is not getting around the lung like it should because of these blood clots. So it's a really good sign um, or really good reminder to, to get checked out the blood tests uh, to know whether you have uh, these blood clots um, forming in your blood is a fairly simple one. Um, and you can talk to your, your doctor about whether that's appropriate and then to get the right treatment if uh, it is indeed happening to you and, and the cause of a reactivation, if you like, of, of symptoms. Okay, thank you, Jason. Okay, now we're gonna go to the live audience. Uh, we have this question from, I think it's KW Kevin W. Wilson. <laughs> Why is this disease so varied in its symptoms? It's a good one. Yeah, I think it is a very good question. I think the answer is we don't really know. A lot of people have various hypotheses around that. Um, genetics is probably a really important element, um, although we haven't really figured out yet what genetic differences um, are predisposing people to having different forms of it. We know that uh, symptoms can vary 
depending on um, where the, the infection um, gets into our, our cells. Um, the medical or scientific term for that is tropism. Um, so we know that the coronavirus has different tropisms, so it can get into your nose um, and start spreading there in, in the cells, um, in the epithelial cells lining your uh, upper airways. And that may be what is causing a disrupted sense of smell. Um, so that, that's one um, issue. We know that if the virus does manage to get down lower into the lungs where it can damage those um, alveoli, the grape-like air sacs, then that can certainly um, uh, speed up uh, a process known as acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. Um, and that's a, a more uh, lethal complication of the coronavirus infection. Okay, thank you. Another question we have from, I think this is our YouTube viewer. Uh, can you actually recover from all of these symptoms? What do you think? I think um, the answer is yes, um, which is great. Uh, it probably depends on the severity of your illness. Um, we know that if you do have um, what I just mentioned, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, that involves a lot of um, uh, inflammatory um, immune cells going into your lung um, where your immune system essentially goes a bit um, overboard in trying to get rid of the virus. And in that over that um, aberrant um, response can actually do more damage to the lung tissue and it can cause um, fibroid, fibrotic material to form in the lungs and scarring of the lungs. And unfortunately, if that does happen, um, that's going to be with you for a while, if not forever. So, um, there, it is possible that it can cause some severe damage um, that you may not recover from at least immediately. Um, but overall, most people don't uh, get severely sick. It's only a minority who do. Um, and overall, you know, things like the loss of um, sense of smell, that does, uh, for most people, return fairly rapidly after the infection is cleared. And again, like we've been finding different symptoms as time goes on, doctors have been seeing more and more different symptoms. Same with COVID-19. We don't know everything there is to know about this particular condition and disease. So um, you're saying that, yes, we can recover from certain ones. Others, we may have other long-term effects. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Obviously, we've only known about this disease for like four months, um, yeah. but we are starting to see some patterns, for example, uh, doctors in the Netherlands reported that when there were when patients experienced severe gastrointestinal upset, um, that that is associated with more severe disease. So we're starting to get a better picture as to you know, what are some of the, the patterns of disease that might indicate that someone is in for a, a worse or you know, milder course of infection. All right, let's take some more questions from our audience. Um, I have heard this question from a few people before. So let me bring this in. Um, is the, are the symptoms related to your blood type? Do a certain blood type, you know, are you more prone to getting certain symptoms and, and having those? Yeah, I have read some papers on that, at least one paper, uh, I think that came out from China. I think I, if I remember correctly, they were suggesting that the type A um, blood blood group uh, ha is more likely to suffer um, worse uh, symptoms than I think blood group B from memory or blood group O. Anyway, I don't really quite remember um, exactly all of the details, but I'm pretty sure that it um, is going to require more investigation to properly understand whether that is a thing, if it's a, a you know, if it's a robust way of understanding more about this disease. I think it's a little contested at the moment. Okay. All right. Our next question. Thank you guys for sending these in. Super helpful. Does coronavirus kill kids? Does it affect children? And Jason, yeah. I think we've worked into this before. We heard in the beginning, you know, a lot, largely the elderly population was at risk, but now we're learning a bit more, right, Jason? Yeah. So we know that overall um, age is one of the biggest risk factors for getting um, sicker from COVID-19. And for a long time, we understood that children um, rarely get infected and even, um, well, actually um, infections among children uh, occurred uh, less frequently than among adults. And that certainly children seem to be very underrepresented among hospitalized patients. Um, but that doesn't mean that their risk is zero. And now we're actually seeing um, an associated inflammatory disease um, that appears a little bit like a thing called Kawasaki disease, which is essentially 
inflammation of the blood vessels. And um, so we're seeing children uh, in Europe and in North America who have um, been very sick and needed intensive care for, the, for um, this inflammatory um, blood vessel uh, problem, which appears quite a lot like Kawasaki disease. They're tr still trying to figure out if it is. Um, regardless, it does respond to the same treatment um, that is used for Kawasaki disease. It's uh, intravenous immunoglobulin. And when kids get that, um, they do have a really good chance of um, full recovery. But unfortunately, this um, inflammatory blood vessel problem has, has been known to kill children. Um, and it uh, is a really severe and but rare um, response to uh, well, we think might be a response to COVID-19. It's still yet to be teased out. Um, the majority of children who have had these um, these worrying, life-threatening symptoms have um, either tested positive to the um, coronavirus um, virus or mm -hmm. to the had antibodies that suggest they've been exposed. Um, but it's still yet to be completely uh, understood. Okay. And we've been talking a lot about blood clots in this particular live stream. Um, so here's this next, here's this next question. Can we take aspirin regularly to tackle clogging issues? Uh, is it part of preventing it? Yeah, good question. I had the same question and I asked the doctor that and he said, no, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, aspirin is the wrong kind of medication to take. Um, for uh, thinning the blood. It, um, that works for preventing um, certain, um, more like the strokes um, that typically people get, but not um, for the same kind of clotting problem we see with COVID-19. So aspirin, unfortunately, isn't going to work for this. That's the advice that I've been giving. Okay. Um, you know, I want to keep going on and on. We're getting a lot more questions, but this one is going to be the last one for this live stream. Uh, does a COVID-19 test, does it detect the virus immediately after it, you test positive? Does it take some time? I'm oh, sorry, immediately after contraction or does it take some time? So it depends on the test. Um, there is one called a PCR test um, and that's looking for the nucleic acid, the genetic fingerprint, if you like, um, the RNA that the virus has, particular features of um, the genetic makeup. Um, that's what the PCR test is looking for. Um, and so if it finds um, the genetic signature of, of the coronavirus, it means that you are infected, you have the virus. Um, we also know that the test can find dead virus. So if it is picking up dead virus particles, um, those are not infectious. And if you um, are tested positive for the coronavirus, we don't know if you are infectious um, because you have live um, uh, um, virus particles or whether these are in fact dead virus particles that are being found uh, on you. We know that the other lot of testing, which is based on antibodies, that indicates whether you have been exposed to the virus and whether your immune system has mounted an antibody response. Um, so that's what that is testing. And that tends to um, uh, be positive if you've been exposed and if you have mounted an immune response um, about a week or two after that exposure. All right. Well, that wraps things up for us. Thanks, Jason, so much. Our Bloomberg News health editor for giving us some great answers, as always. Hope to have you back. And thank you, guys, everybody, for watching. Make sure to follow us, us at Quick Take for all the latest updates and more. Bye for now. Thanks, Rumi. Bye. <laughs> Bye.